if someone were to give you the obligation to give a devotional on Wednesday night and this came as a surprise to you, most of us would turn to the book of Psalms for a devotional information. And I hope and trust that in our study of the book of Psalms that we can get a greater appreciation of the God that we serve. And so if you will find in your notes tonight something that looks like that, studying Psalms, we'll go from the introduction page to the first page and note the notes. Studying the book of Psalms. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19, a passage that we have quoted often. Speak into yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. On page 1, the book of Psalms, because almost every psalm contains some uh, notes of praise to God, because of that it's called the book of praise. A number of authors, some are known and some are unknown, Almost half of the authors inspired of God are attributed, most half of the Psalms are attributed to David, even two by Solomon, Psalm 2 and Psalm 127. And then there is one by Moses, probably wrote, uh, he probably wrote the book uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, we know that he did. And at the same time, he was writing Psalm 90. Fifty are anonymous. The time written, the Psalms cover a wide span from Moses to Ezra and to Nehemiah. The position in our Bible is that it's the 19th book in the Bible the 19th book in the Old Testament, 18 have preceded it and 47 to follow it. It has 150 chapters. It has 2,461 verses, 43,743 words. Now I didn't count them. But I know that the key word of the book of Psalms is worship. Two key passages bear this out. Psalm 19, verse 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. My first six years of schooling was in a little two-room school building right in front of the Blackwater Macedonia Church of Christ. And every morning, without fail, our teacher would have us say the prayer that let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And following that little prayer, we always thought of it as a prayer, we would salute the flag. That was what we did in that little two-room school building. In Psalm 145, verse 21, the mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh shall bless his holy name forever and ever. Now I am saying that the key chapter is Psalm 100. The two central themes of worship and praise are beautifully wed in 100th Psalm. Some observations about the book of Psalms. It is the longest and perhaps the most widely used book in the Bible. On page two, there is a tremendous breadth of subject matter in the book of Psalms. Jubilation, 
war, peace, worship, judgment, the coming of Christ prophesied, praise, lament. And among the many favorite of the books of Psalms are Psalm 1, Psalm 19, Psalm 22, and of course Psalm 23. I've often said that when I get to heaven, I'm going to look David up and praise him for writing Psalm 23 when he was young. Because I've used it so many times in Christian funerals. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Psalm 24 is one of the favorite. <laughs> Psalm 37, Psalm 72, Psalm 100, Psalm 101, and of course the longest chapter in the book of Psalms, the longest chapter in the Bible is Psalm 119. There's 176 verses. I've preached 17 gospel meetings for the Davis Chapel Church of Christ in Fett County. They have a remarkable thing that they do every Sunday. Just before they begin their song service, they have a good reader to stand up and read a chapter in the Bible. And over the years, they have read through the Bible. And I've often asked them, what did you do when you came to Psalm 119? They said, oh, Brother Sides, we divided that up, 176 verses. Then there's Psalm 150. The book of Psalms is actually five books. Biblical scholars have divided them up into five, the book into five books. Book one is Psalm 1 to chapter 41. They call that the book of Genesis. Book two, Psalm 43 through 72. They call that Exodus. Then book three, Psalm 73 through 89, Leviticus, book four, Numbers, and book five, Deuteronomy. And there are some reasons for that because as you study the book of Exodus, those chapters in the book of Psalms, Psalm 43 through 72 have a lot of references to the Exodus. There are 10 different types of Psalms, and I don't wanna to mention too much of that tonight because there is a reason in future lessons I wanna talk about those 10 different types. So if you will turn now to page four, there are so many things mentioned in Psalms that are fulfilled in the New Testament. For an example, in Psalm 2, chapter 2, verse 7, God will declare him to be his son. Well, of course, he did fulfill that in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. There at the transfiguration, as well as at baptism, Matthew 3, verse 17. And then um, when we look at chapters 22, especially, we're going to see a lot that deals with the crucifixion of Christ in prophecy. You know, sometimes you just wonder what, why the gospel writers didn't spend more time in telling us about the crucifixion. Well, Psalm 22 tells us a lot and we're gonna spend some time there looking at the things that Christ went through in his crucifixion. Well, on page uh, five, six, seven, those are the four, five books uh, of the uh, book of Psalms. Okay, on page 11, it's not listed that way, but take a Bible with the Old and New Testament, lay it on a table, and try to open it right in the middle of the pages and you'll probably open it to the book of Psalms. It may be a surprise to you that right in the middle of God's eternal word, 
he put the Jewish hymn book. Okay, on the next page, about page 13, reasons to read Psalms. When you want to find comfort, certainly read Psalm 23. If you want to meet God personally in scripture, Psalm 103. To learn a new prayer, Psalm 136. To learn a new song, Psalm 92. To learn more about God, read Psalm 24. To understand yourself more clearly, Psalm 8. To know how to come to God each day, Psalm 5. To be forgiven for your sins. I don't know how many times people have heard sermons from Psalm 51. When you want to feel worthwhile, read Psalm 139. David said, if I go into the uttermost parts of the earth, behold, thou art there. To understand why you should read the Bible, those 176 verses in Psalm 119, to give thanks to God, Psalm 136. I disagree with the author a little bit of these. I, I think Psalm 100 is the psalm that we say at Thanksgiving. To know why we should worship God, Psalm 104. Well, let's go to Psalm chapter one. And if you have the outline, the truly happy person that's based on Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the river of water, or rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Incidentally, I will give to you a outline for each particular chapter, 150 chapters, the book of Psalms, to this evening. And uh, of course, again, written by the denominational Bible scholar, but they are tremendous in reading, following the outline. But follow the outline with me tonight that I put together. Just as the tabernacle or the temple were in the physical center of the people of God in the Old Testament. The book of Psalms is right in the center of the Bible. Psalm, Psalms has been appropriately called the hymn book of the Old Testament because 100, all of the 150 Psalms were at one time put to music and sung in public and private worship. The center chapter of the Bible is Psalm 119. Every verse of that chapter says something about the value of God's word. Psalm 119, verse 18, open my eyes that I might see the wonderful things in your law. My prayer is that as we study the book of Psalms over the next few weeks, that the Lord will indeed open our eyes through the word to wonderful things in his songbook so that we might be able to respond to his word in worship and live lives that bring him glory. Jewish tradition tells us that the first two Psalms are originally one. To me, that seems very appropriate because these two Psalms definitely go together as an introduction to the whole book of Psalms. They deal with two most important issues of life. The first psalm deals with the blessedness of loving and obeying God's law. And the second psalm deals with the blessings of loving and submitting to God's Son, 
the Messiah. The first psalm has been called the gateway to the book of Psalms. It talks about two men, two ways, two destinies in 121 words. The two men of Psalm 1 are placed in sharp contrast. One man is obedient to God's word and the other is disobedient. One lives a God-centered life, the other lives a self-centered life. One is following God through obedience to his word and receiving the blessings. The other is rejecting God and his word and is facing his judgment. The contrast vividly seen by bringing together the first and last words of this psalm, blessed and perish. Blessed means happy, to be on a road that leads to ultimate joy. Perish means to be lost, to be on a road that leads nowhere and to ultimate ruin. In Psalm 1, the psalmist describes the person that God blesses or the truly happy person. He also describes the person that God condemns. So let's notice in verses 1 through 3, the person that God blesses. Psalm 1 begins with the phrase, blessed is the man, or happy is the man. Happiness is the universal wish uh, for all, by all. At least one time each year, someone will wish us happiness. It may be in the form of a happy birthday, a happy new year, a happy anniversary. But how many truly happy people do you know? Some look for happiness in all the wrong places and in doing all the wrong things. Some look for it in jobs, in money, new homes, new cars, alcohol, and even drugs. These things are all temporary. What about lasting happiness in spite of circumstances? How is it that some people who are in the worst of life's circumstances still claim to be happy, to be blessed, and to be joyful. Who is the happy person according to Psalm 1? It's a person who is separated from the world, verse 1. A person who is separated from the world will not walk in the counsel of the wicked. The word wicked or ungodly carries two ideas. It means to be loose with morals. It also means loose from God without him as an anchor or controlling device. It refers to those who are controlled by their own desires and their own emotions and their flesh rather than by the word. We're to avoid counsel from those who do not have God as an anchor. Some months ago, I recommended to this young lady who was having marital problems that she go and see this good man that I knew, preacher of the gospel and a marital counselor. But somehow or another she got the advice that she ought to go to this person in Tuscaloosa who is a professional counselor. And that professional counselor gave her this advice. What do you really want to do? Finally, he got out of her. I really want to, I really want to have an affair. That's what you need to do. That's what you need to go. That's the way you ought to go. She did. Her life is a mess now. She's so far away from God. She's so far away from his instruction. She went to the wrong counselor. She went to the counselor who really told her the way of Satan. The Bible has a lot to say on how we should walk. We should ask God to show us how to walk. 
Psalm 143 verse 8 says, Teach me the way in which I should walk, for to you I will lift up my soul. We should walk in truth, the psalmist said in Psalm 86 verse 11. In Ephesians chapter 4 verses 1 and 2, Paul says, I implore you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling with which you have been called with humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. We should walk in the spirit, Galatians 5, 16. We're to walk by faith and not by sight. And so a person who is happy is one who is separated from the world. A person who is separated from the world will not stand in the way of sinners. Sinners in the Hebrew was an archery term. It means to fall short or to miss the mark. The mark is the will of God. Sin is the transgression of God's law. And we're all sinners. We've all missed the mark. Sinners also refers to those who have deliberately chosen a way of life and a path contrary to the will of God. How should we stand? Psalm 33 verse eight says, let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. We should stand firm in the faith, 1 Corinthians 16, 13. We should stand together with one another, with one mind and spirit, Philippians 1 verse 27. We're to not stand in the way of sinners. A person who is separated from the world will not sit in the seat of the scornful, the mockers. The word sit means to dwell, to remain, to abide. It emphasizes a settled state of condition. Mockers is a word that means to ridicule. It refers to one who actively engages and putting down the things of God in his word. Mocking can occur not only by decoration of word, but by decoration of a way of life. How do people mock the word of God? By ridicule, by rejection, by listening to the word proclaimed, but then ignoring it. In essence, we mock the word when we fail to obey and align our lives accordingly. In summary, he has a crowd-resisted mentality. He doesn't listen to what the crowd says. He doesn't go where the crowd goes. He doesn't do what the crowd does. He doesn't live by the motto, everybody else is doing it. Or everybody else is doing it. He rejects the thinking and the values and the lifestyle of those who have left God out of their life. In summary, he has a one-track mind. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. This means that instead of thinking and living like the world around him, he lets the word of God shape his thinking and transform his life. A person who is happy according to Psalm 1 is a person who is saturated with the word, verse 2. The law of the Lord, this is the object of his delight. The law refers to the word of God. Notice this is not something that the blessed man has to do, but something that he loves to do. This is one idea where we are all deficient. Our Bible knowledge is embarrassingly limited. God does not expect us to be scholars, but he does expect us to school ourselves in his word, at least enough to defend our faith and explain what we believe to others. How often should we read the Bible? I don't have time. I have to work all so many hours a day. This man, on his law, meditates day and night. Meditate is often associated with Eastern religions or cults, but this is not the idea here. 
It is to think about the instruction that God has given for life and allows it to shape our thoughts and our actions. Meditate is a very important word. It pictures a cow chewing on her cud. God has no plan or program by which you are to grow and develop as a believer, as a Christian, apart from the word. You can become as busy as a bee in church work, but you won't grow by means of activity. You will grow by meditating upon the word of God. That is, by going over it again and again in your thinking until it becomes a part of your life. It can thoroughly equip us for every good work. Notice five things that Paul tells us about the Bible. It's holy, it's powerful and able to change your life. It's God-breathed, it's useful, it's profitable. It's useful for four things, for leading, for teaching. It is the in instrument of the Holy Spirit. It is the instrument that the Holy Spirit uses to provide us with a standard of what is right and wrong and what is good and bad and true and free. For reproof, it is the instrument of the Holy Spirit, the instrument that the Holy Spirit uses to convict us of sin and to show us where we are wrong in our thinking, our feelings, our values, our actions, our reactions. It brings us under conviction and it motivates us to repent and to change. And then for correction, it's the instrument that God uses to point us in the right direction and to correct our sinful thoughts and motives and feelings and actions. It tells us how to change and what to change. For training in righteousness, it's the instrument that the Holy Spirit uses to help us develop new patterns of life so that we are living God's way. It can thoroughly equip us for every good work. It prepares us to become 21st Christians, gladiators, who can enter into the arena of the sinful and not crumble under their pressures. A person who is saturated by the waters, or situated by the waters, excuse me, he's like a tree planted Man behind the tree was Adam and Eve. Man in a tree was Noah. Man under a tree was Elijah. A man up a tree was Zacchaeus. A man on the tree was Jesus. Man like a tree should be you and me, which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither, and whatsoever he does, it prospers. This psalm talks about the person that God judges. The wicked are like the chaff in which it's worthless. It's burned. It only those who are turning away from God could see this. Adam and Eve, unbelievers would face God's judgment but not be able to stand the test. And so Psalm 1 is a tremendous psalm to help us live the Christian life. I just wish that we read it often and applied it more to our lives. My time is gone. Thank you for coming and being with us. And I look forward to a study of the book of Psalms, not only to chapter one, but other chapters. I would that you take these outlines that are given and read the psalm on your own and find in it spiritual direction and hope and security. Thank you and may God bless.